thank you so much for inviting me here. It really is a privilege to be here, and uh, this is. It's always exciting to connect with other people that really like technology and an e-club. It just, yes. it just it's makes perfect. sense. Yeah, it does. So uh, I wanted to talk with you a bit about audiology, hearing loss, and technology, uh, all of my passions. I actually started in uh, 1998 going to Mozambique, and uh, that was my first time on site. And the purpose of the trip to Mozambique was just trying to introduce the whole uh, idea of audiology and ear and hearing care uh, within that country. I really didn't know what was going on in that country, if there was audiology or if they had doctors that would deal with ear surgery. So it was a, a real a, a puzzle to me at the time and no one seemed to be able to answer the question. And as it turns out, when we were doing the planning in 1997, the um, folks that where we ended up at finally started getting emails. And uh, so we were able to, instead of sending something through snail mail and waiting and hoping something would get where it needed to go, um, we were able to email. And of course, they had electrical outages, so there might have been delays, but at least we were able to get some responses. And, and unfortunately, no one really knew if there was any audiology in the country. Uh, the other purpose, though, was just training and dispensing hearing aids, uh, training individuals that were there, and then um, doing testing and dispensing hearing aids. One of my big um, soapboxes is always making sure that whatever we do is very sustainable. And so 1998 was the first time going to Mozambique, and since then um, I've actually been traveling in, in other countries as well. The one thing that I have eventually migrated to was I would have students that would go with me and they would um, you know get practicum hours and, which is great and they would have to take time uh, a, a bit of time we always tried to make it so it was the very very end of our summer uh, term uh, and eventually we discovered that we could make make the whole experience a study abroad experience and then the students could go and they would actually get academic uh, credit for being um, there uh, and the other part of it was and they would also get practical credit as well and it actually I have to apply each and every year and let the president of the university know what my plans are and the president has to approve so it, it really does go all the way to the top for approval uh, there aren't very many study abroad projects at UT Dallas. So one of the things that I, am, uh, I do with the students, because it is a course, I want to make sure that they really understand what the needs are, what's going on, what the World Health Organization has to offer information-wise about the different regions that we might find ourselves in. So, you know, I, I have them go and to the World Health Organization. So they, they will spend, they'll sign up for summer um, long semester and they're required to do a lot of self-studying. We do a few lectures as well. So the World Health Organization also has some really great guidelines. A lot of people don't realize that were developed specifically for ear and hearing care in developing countries. Um, the students learn a lot about, you know, dealing in countries that really have very limited resources. Uh, and the catch, though, is, is that while we are a very cultural nation, a lot of people that find themselves here in the U.S. oftentimes assimilate to our culture. And it, it's difficult as an American, you know, if you've grown up in the U.S., to understand that whole assimilation process and becoming more aware of the cultural um, issues that are there, very sensitive to what's going on uh, with the different cultures. Uh, the other things that we talk about uh, before we go have to do with ethical and best practices. I really uh, believe strongly that in order to carry out best practices, um, you really have to be very ethical about everything you're doing so that you are really above board and not making big promises that you can't fulfill. Uh, and, you know, the, the nicest thing for me is that it forces me to think outside of the box whenever I go to 
a, a developing country. Uh, so that, you know, there, are, there aren't the abundance of resources. And there have been times we've gotten on site and we've realized we don't have some of the supplies. Uh, and so then we have to think about, well, how, how did it used to be done or how can I go about getting this in another way uh, and still provide the best? Uh, so after the students get, they do the self-study uh, before we travel and then eventually we travel to the site. So as I mentioned, um, I've had teams that have been going. 1998 was the first time we w we've gone every year in Mozambique until 2008. That was my last year. And after 10 years, I really didn't seem to get an uptake from the Minister of Health in Mozambique. And uh, the, in 2007, we were only, we were allowed in the hospital, but we really weren't allowed to do much in the hospital. They didn't want to promote it on the radio because they're afraid because the Minister of Health didn't approve it, nor did he disapprove it. They thought we just don't want to raise a red flag and they don't want to let people know that we were there, which was a real disservice to those that we had already served. Um, they didn't know we had been there. 2008, my team sat half busy. Uh, so half the day they would just sit and wait for something to do, and it's a long way to go. And it's really a very hard trip to go to Mozambique. Um, it, it is, it, I could tell you all about traveling to Mozambique, but we won't <laughs> right now. Uh, very, very rigorous trip. So by the time in 2008 when I connected with the Minister of Health after our, our uh, site visit, then I was trying to get a clear approval, and if I didn't get a clear approval, I decided we weren't going to go to Mozambique. So I never got the clear approval, so 2009, I just said I would divert my team. And uh, I had had um, some individuals from actually all over the world that have joined me, um, students as well as professionals that have joined along as team members. And there was one young lady from South Africa, and uh, she had joined me a, a few times, and she kept saying, we should do this in South Africa. We should be able to provide these services in South Africa. And she wanted to see how it was done, so she kept working on building her own um, project in South Africa. And so I called her um, early to, or in the, after we'd gotten back in 2008 and just said, do you have your project up and running yet? And she said, we're going to launch it um, in July. And I said, well, good, I have a team for you. <laughs> So we, we went in 2009 to South Africa, and it's in the Mpumalanga province area. Uh, not quite as impoverished as Mozambique at this point. Um, actually, from what I had witnessed, far healthier people um, in South Africa, but it still is very rural. There's still a lot of HIV, AIDS. There's still a lot of TB. There, there's a lot of illness and problems. Um, so Mozambique was pretty much the poorest of the poor, and then we kind of want to step up, and it was a much easier, easier um, project for us in many ways. So my other guide, guideline has always been not only to be sustainable, but to work myself out of a job uh, wherever I, I am at. And 2010, when we went, there were two universities that were also working, and um, I realized that I had worked myself out of a job by 2010 in, in that part of South Africa. One thing that I've been doing for a number of years is I have a research scholar appointment at the University of Witwatersrand in Johannesburg that I've been interacting with their students and their faculty, uh, and we've been collaborating on many things. Uh, so then I decided, well, I, th I think I'll divert my team to Malawi. We went to Malawi for, for one uh, visit. Malawi was a, a totally, you know, very different because there were expats from Australia that had just moved to Malawi, uh, and they were providing audiology services trying to get it started in Malawi. And so we just asked, what can we do to move your project forward? And so we did a number of things while we were there, working with the, the Australians. And there were two audiologists, the Australians, in the whole country. Um, 2012, uh, I went back to South Africa, but we decided to try a different area. Um, so another rural practicum for us. And it was 
um, a, a great experience. 2015 was this year. We, we ended up in yet another area. Uh, so I, I really prefer to spend my time, you know, in, in the rural areas where people are really underserved, where the resources are very low. Um, I mean, I, I do enjoy modern facilities, you know, but I really, uh, there's something about working with people that have uh, very limited resources. It just um, it is very enriching for me. I learn quite a bit from, from individuals. So 2013, though, was Zambia. So Zambia uh, became a little bit different for us. Um, we had it's a, a small team. Oh, I see a misspelling. Uh, so we had some of our AUD students that went with, and then uh, there was also another clinical audiologist as well as myself. Um, and we ended up arriving. That's when we met with, um, um, he's now Dr. Afra Mwamba. I'll, go, I'll be talking a little bit more about some of the technology and what we were doing in Zambia, but um, it, it's always quite interesting. You see Malawi to the right, uh, so, you know, Zambia is the next door neighbor. Very different feel. Every, every country I've been in in Africa, and I've been in uh, many of them, there's always a different feel, but there's always some common sorts of um, behaviors that, that, that occur um, that I, I find really fascinating. This particular figure, as you'll notice, it started in 1990, and now you're seeing the map changing shapes as we're going, eventually making it to 2100. So the world population continues to grow, and in um, more of a, I guess, relative, you will notice the areas that are really growing the most. And what's also happening, though, is as as certain countries are growing at a much faster rate than other countries, you'll notice Europe seems to be shrinking as far as population growth. The U.S., uh, you know, stays almost the same, maybe shrinking. But you see where there are great needs, um, India and Africa, some of China. But the unfortunate thing is, is that as the world population grows, the number of medical workers is not growing at that same rate. And when we talk about specialists and specialties, uh, such as audiology, it's not growing at all at the same rate. So, you know, I was at the American Academy of Otolaryngology this morning doing a talk, and, you know, we would hear different people from all over the world, different otolaryngologists say, well, my country has 22 million people and there are three otolaryngologists. Another one, well, we have, you know, 14 million people and there's only one otolaryngologist. And that's kind of the figures we're seeing. So, you know, we look at global burden in general. Uh, we know globally that w we will see poverty and hunger as, as populations grow. Universal education is, is problematic. You know, some countries are really great where they have very literate citizens, and in other countries there's just not even the resources to educate their people. Um, gender equity uh, is actually... Uh, now becoming a more recognized problem. I find it interesting because uh, a lot of the philanthropic organizations are realizing that they um, can aim their resources and efforts at females and educating females, and they'll find the community will, will be all the better for it. If they're educating the males, the males will become educated and they leave. They leave their families, they leave their communities. Um, so more and more of the philanthropic organizations are realizing you know, that, that there is not the same gender equity, but where they need to aim their resources now with the females, because they stay. With our six areas of focus, maternal and child health. Yeah, absolutely. It fits absolutely. Right in with the rotary. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I mean, it's, it's more bang for the buck is what it is. I know, no, we all have limited resources. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, child health. Um, you know, I, um, I, I was in China recently, and I was talking with students there, and I said, every country has one thing they share in common. It is their best resource. And do you know what their resource is? And the students were trying to think, and I said, now you have to think, because not every country has gold, so you can't say gold. Not every country has diamonds, so that's not a, something, but every country shares 
the exact same resource. Do you know what that resource is? Their people. Their people. And of course, you know, children, healthy children, that's their future. Um, and, you know, the, the greatest, most valuable resource in any country are their people. And so, you know, trying to make sure that everyone is healthy as, as best they can get. Uh, and then, you know, we, we know that the, there's a huge issue with HIV AIDS. Uh, when I was in Mozambique and walking along some of the towns that were there, I knew what the prevalence of HIV AIDS was even in 2008, that I knew that in those communities within some years, 70% would be gone that were occupying these towns. Um, and so it is very concerning. When we were in South Africa, my students were actually very surprised when they would take intake on mothers and they had their brand new babies. And they would say, well, you know, are you taking any medicines? And, and the women would say, well, I'm taking something for HIV. Um, you know, and the students, I think, were very surprised that it was every mother that they spoke with. And that meant every baby had to have treatment. Uh, and they're doing a fantastic job in South Africa. Uh, and, and a great deal of it is thanks to the U.S. sending a lot of anti, the, um, um, I suddenly blank because I saw malaria, the um, ARVs. Uh, oh. Yeah, yeah uh, for the HIV AIDS, uh, antiretrovirals. Um, malaria and typhoid, um, you know, people don't realize that even as early as the 1960s, we had malaria in the U.S. Uh, and we were able to wipe that out. So, you know, when we go to places in Africa where malaria is still a problem and you'll see individuals that have had malaria many times uh, and some of, the, some of these children have been devastated cognitively because they end up with cerebral malaria. And so, again, the resource of that country is devastated because of malaria. Uh, and so hearing loss is actually a, a burden as well. And when we look at the hearing loss and, and what, we're, what we have in mind or what we're looking at in the world. It's the most common chronic disabling condition. We know that 642 million are affected to some degree. 360 million have significant hearing loss worldwide. Disabling hearing loss, we see 798,000 newborns born annually uh, with hearing loss or they will acquire permanent hearing loss for both ears. One in every four adults over 45 years of age will acquire hearing loss. Um, and what we do know, these are facts, we, we can back it up with science, is that if we intervene, if we are able to find some ways of remediating, it's going to reduce social, educational, uh, economic consequences of hearing loss. There are facts that individuals that have hearing loss, depending on the degree of hearing loss, their ability to earn an income keeps going, dwindling away as their hearing loss is worse. Um, that also ends up resulting in um, individuals not really being able to access information about hygiene, about health, uh, to avoid disease outbreak. Can you only imagine someone that may have had a severe hearing loss during the whole outbreak of Ebola? And I was in South Africa as it was breaking out. So, you know, you immediately think about, I at least can see something on TV and I can hear what's going on. But the individuals that have a severe hearing loss, they're not watching TV. And how do they understand what's going on, especially in those countries where the outbreak really occurred? Um, and it's unfortunate that if you have hearing loss, you don't really have the knowledge that you can prevent yourself from getting worse or more hearing loss. Because if you have hearing loss, you can be at higher risk. So in many of these developing countries, there's the, the noise levels are horrible. There are mines. There's lots of different, um, you know, you, you'll see them kind of breaking down equipment with all sorts of hard tools. And um, th that will lead to more hearing loss. Yeah. There's a lot of really great uh, research that's come out. And what we do know about hearing loss are things that we've, we've suspected for many years. And now we have the evidence saying that untreated hearing loss, there is a nice direct link to depression 
as well as social isolation in seniors. It makes sense. If you're not able to hear other people, you're going to say, oh, I don't want to go do that right now. It's, I'm too tired. I don't want to do that. Um, so a senior will start becoming more and more socially isolated. That means they're going to be less active. That ends up with the whole cascading effect of other health issues that they're looking at. In children, we also know that uh, with hearing loss, if it's not remediated, they're either going to have delayed language or they will have no language. Because again, the oral history of our community and our family is learned. We learn a lot of our culture. We learn a lot about how we behave in our society just by oral, oral communication. And some of it is kind of incidental hearing or eavesdropping. What's really crazy is, is that in developing countries, uh, the remediable and preventable uh, forms of hearing loss, there are uh, probably about 70% 70, 70 of hearing loss is remediable, it is preventable. Um, and when identified early, the outcomes tend to be much better. Unfortunately, if they're not identified, then you have another cascading effect. If there's pathology, um, a lot of things getting worse and worse and worse. So we look at the global estimates. 15% of the world's adult population has some degree of hearing loss. 25% of, of them are older than 65 years of age. What you'll notice on this particular um, uh, figure is, is it looks at the prevalence of disabling hearing loss, and you see it goes from 0 to 50%. And then we're looking at the average gross national index per capita in thousands of U.S. dollars. So we're all the way to the right. Then we know that's a pretty developed high-income country. Um, with a GNI. If we go over to where our gross national index is much lower, then you'll also notice that we have a much higher prevalence of hearing loss. So in other words, those countries that can least afford to deal with hearing loss are the ones that are bearing the biggest burden. So situation, situations I've experienced in low and middle income countries um, is that when we talk about remediation for hearing loss, if it can't be surgically remediated, if it can't be remediated through um, some medication or antibiotics, then our next move is hearing aids to bring an individual into the community. Current hearing aid production, um, when we're looking at these low and middle income countries, meets less than 10% of the global needs. And that's, that is um, quite a, a a, a big loss. If we think about what we need, projected 35 million, million hearing aids required each year in developing countries, and yet we already know that, that um, they likely are not going to be having a provision of hearing, hearing aids. Only 1 million hearing aids are provided in developing countries out of what is needed is 35 million. The other, other aspect that comes into play is that you know, again, we want something that is sustainable, so pricing of hearing aids. And it, it gives a person great pride, no matter where they live, to know that they were able to take care of their own needs and take care of the problems they have. If we think about a hearing aid, local economy in Nigeria and looking at the least expensive hearing aid uh, is priced at about $222. That would equal one month's salary for an individual. You, know, you have to think about some of the countries where you know, unemployment is 70%. Uh, so is that going to be affordable? The hearing aids also, you know, because they are oftentimes built outside of that country, there's going to be an import tax. There's going to be local levies. That's going to drive the prices up even higher yet. Now, the other big concerning thing when I was showing you our burgeoning world as the, the population is growing uh, we have barriers in, in service provision. Most countries have no audiology or hearing health services. Uh, and we, you know, have the old-fashioned tuning fork tests. We're not going to get into to that much at all. I just wanted to bring that up that, yeah, there, there are historical tuning fork tests. And you see that there are some of the ones that are still used by some of the docs, even in developed countries. But... There are some, some limitations to using the old tuning fork. I mean, it's great. There's, it's not electric powered. You can put it in your pocket. Uh, but a lot of people don't realize that using a tuning fork is very dependent upon the examiner having good hearing. Because oftentimes it is comparing patient's hearing to the examiner. 
well, if they both have hearing loss, the examiner's going to say, I think your ear just fine. <laughs> if you have one ear that's really good and one ear that isn't so good, the better ear is still going to be able to pick up the tuning fork. It's going to hear it. And then, of course, I have yet to find a nice, sterile, quiet environment in any place in Africa. So, you know, it's noisy. And if I'm trying to have someone listen to a very soft tuning fork, it really isn't going to work very well. So, you know, we look at the old technology. It's great. We've come a long way. Can you imagine just 100 years ago, only 100 years ago, first transcontinental telephone call occurred? That's really hard to believe when you think about what we're able to do now. Very shortly after that, within a few months, the first transatlantic telephone call occurred. Um, and, you know, I was asking my husband, I said, well, that, I, I'm curious, how did they do that? And then I started reading, they used the old telegraph lines. That was their, their foundation of using the telegraph lines. But it still meant that they had to use what was there electronically, and everybody thought, oh, we've really moved ahead in the world. And look at what we're, where we're at now. Uh, audiology services, uh, we have a ratio of audiologists to general population in developing countries is one for every 500,000 to 6.25 million. And again, there are some countries that have no audiologists. In developed countries, there's one audiologist for 20,000. I personally cannot deal with 20,000 people. It's not possible. Uh, and so when we start looking at what can I do, uh, it brings up, you know, what is it I am doing? We can do quite a few things. A lot, of, a lot of people don't realize what audiology services entail in addition to just saying you have a hearing loss, but trying to identify whether um, people are putting themselves at risk for hearing loss and doing some measurements and helping people understand how they can protect their ears. We also are not only testing um, your, your hearing, but we're also very involved in vestibular balance issues uh, and finding out where is the problem and isolating it. And then eventually we get to the remediation. And of course, when we start talking about doing any of these tests, then we have to validate and look at some of the outcome measures to make sure that we really are doing what we think we're doing. And then monitor the, the patient's status. Uh, so if I, if I fit a hearing aid, I want to make sure that that hearing aid is working and that the person's really getting benefit, and then I want to make sure over time. So, you know, we tend to see our patients over a longer period of time. Our equipment really is, it tends to be quite bulky. Um, they have to be calibrated. They're, they're very scientific sort of um, equipment. If I'm wanting to identify if someone has a hearing loss, uh, and if my equipment isn't really telling the truth, that's a problem. They, the equipment is really quite large. They sit on a table. They're, they are needing electricity. You can't really move them around. If you move them around, they're going to lose calibration, then they're not telling you the truth. Uh, and because I'm putting sound into a person's ears and trying to find out the very softest level they hear, we also have to have sound-treated rooms. And then the other part is very specialty, specialized um, individuals that can carry out, carry out the, this particular skill. Our students finish with a bachelor's degree, and then from there they, have, they go on for a doctor of audiology. So they have eight years you know, in college to be able to provide services. That's not reality in other countries. Um, it, it really, the U.S. is one of the few countries that have the, the resources to be able to have doctor of audiology. So innovation becomes pretty exciting now that we have, uh, you know, the, the first light bulb was very innovative. And then we start looking at what other innovation is available as we move into, you know, the technology. And it wasn't too long ago that you know, the very first computers came out, and they were huge. And then over time, we have, you know, a lot of possibilities that have, have opened up. When I am trying to serve in a low- and middle-income country, then there rarely is stable electricity. Sometimes we'll have power surges that can destroy the equipment. And an audiometer alone is $40,000. So my other equipment is twenty to thirty thousand dollars. So if I have a power surge that's going to destroy it, I I don't want to plug into the electricity. 
um, having my equipment calibrated, and then quality control during testing, making sure the environment is quiet and attesting to the fact that it's quiet. Um, and then, again, shortage of the trained staff. So some of the recent innovations that we, we now know. It goes back to that light bulb going to the big computers, and now everything is becoming more and more miniaturized. The components are so much smaller, which means we can now have it battery operated. It's not draining power. Um, and the batteries now are becoming, you know, so rechargeable that, you know, they can go, some, some equipment can go two to three days without recharging. Microchip technology helps with a lot of that, and the microprocessors. So, you know, we end up starting to see moving those microchips eventually, you know, we, we're seeing the computers. And from computers, we're now very portable. We have the, the smartphones, we have the iPads, and um, it, it continues getting so much smaller. And someone was just, you know, kind of a joke recently I was hearing was you have a smartphone and you can Google something, you can do many things on it, and then someone said, well, what about calling? Oh yeah, I can call on my smartphone. The original, the original intention of that, huh? Mobile communication. Uh, this is a wonderful quote. Has arguably had a bigger impact on humankind in a shorter period of time than any other invention in human history. And um, you know, we look at the pace that mobile phones have spread globally. It's it's unmatched. Um, when we look at any other technology in history. So, you know, see 2003 to 2010, the uptake. So there are some wonderful things when we look at the Mobile and Millennium Development Goals, which I would encourage you to look at. It's a great group. Uh, and their goals are to, to try to reduce or end poverty, hunger, universal education, you know, to improve that, try to deal with gender equity. All those burdens that we're talking about, that's what they're aiming to, to deal with. Jeffrey Sachs has a new book out. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So mobile and millennium uh, development, we're able to put those smartphones to great use. We also know that we can use video conferencing. Um, we're only limited by our bandwidth. We're only limited by the cell phone speed. Uh, our equipment is centralized, so that allows us, again, in audiology, we went from a huge audiometer till eventually we now have these wonderful little gadgets that are quite small um, and, and portable that allows us to move into telehealth and telemedicine, which has been around for decades in many other medical practices, EEG, psychology, counseling. If we think about the definition of telehealth, application, um, it's an application of telecommunications technology. We're wanting to deliver audiology at a distance for assessing, intervening, and consulting. And we're able to use medical information. We're exchanging it from one site to another. And um, where there are no audiology services, that allows us to start engaging. And we can help with the shortage of trained staff by implementing those services through the telehealth. And now we don't have to worry about the expensive equipment because we're able to be very creative and use some of the structure that's there already and reach out and using teleaudiology. Um, so what we are able to use with teleaudiology is very much what you're experiencing now. We're able to do video conferencing. We have our laptops. We have to have two computers, one on the patient side and oops, one on um, the clinician side. So we have a few ways of employing. We have synchronous, so that's real time, and that is assessing and uh, interacting through video conference. And that means that whoever's on the other side is able to engage with me, and it's a, a bi-directional transmission. So synchronous, you see a good example of it. We have the clinician side, we have the, web, the patient side, and they're, they both are linking into um, one piece of equipment. This actually was, it is the Kudu wave that I um, have worked with uh, with South Africa. It just, you have to have a secure transmission, and then it's just simply a remote desktop VPN so I can ex access. Asynchronous is a little different, they call it store and forward, and where we can have digital email, or digital pictures emailed, faxes, um, and things are sent out. We've been doing asynchronous store and forward for so many, many, many years. Uh, so that, 
sometimes what we can find, you know, if it's secured and encrypted, eventually we can transmit a lot of information. But we can use a hybrid. We can mix the two, um, get some information ahead of time and some information as I'm talking with the patient. We can have a trained facilitator. That would mean that we're able to have individuals that are employed and uh, allow them to start earning a wage. At the patient side, the trained facilitator is not an audiologist, it's someone that's been trained to, to help fit the headsets on, instruct the patients in the local dialect and connect electronically oops, to the testing professional. And if we need troubleshooting, they can do troubleshooting, but very cursory things. And then the clinician can get on the video conference. And the important thing is, is that when we start practicing, we have to look at some of the conforming to professional standards and the code of ethics, and if there's a scope of practice. So, you know, in, um, in Zambia, there is no license for practicing audiology. I say there is none. They've just moved forward with that very recently. Um, but we also want to make sure that our equipment is calibrated. We're maintaining records. And so in Zambia, our last, the, in 2013, I said we'd come back to that. We were training the local clinical officers and um, with the patient-centered care, with triage. So you see we have a hearing clinic. We're working at the hospitals. Um, and Alfred Mwamba, this is one of our um, training exercises, actually, where he was with me in my in my home, and we were training some of the local folks, and we also had our on-site training as well, working side by side with uh, individuals in um, Lusaka and Dola. And then, I'm almost through, mobile communication devices, um, we have trying to maximize that. That's another project that I'm working on is um, mHealth using smartphones uh, where you're able to do not only hearing tests, but health assessments, and able to utilize the video camera and microphone that's on a smartphone. That's my colleague at, in Pretoria, University of Pretoria in South Africa. And so what they are able to do is have the mobile phone with a nurse or a um, community worker go door to door and do health assessments for individuals. So. One of the projects we're looking at now is training community workers, getting the equipment produced, and then continue with the validating and confirming that the equipment really is accurate. And we just want to make sure we're not sacrificing any quality. It has to be the best that I can provide, that I would provide to anybody within my community. And that, you know, we have to have a, a process of validation that's really critical for us. Mm -hmm.